Hello everybody and welcome to episode 119 of the Agile Podcast. This is a summary episode of one of our prestigious pint series with the one and only global superstar and author of Coaching Agile Teams, Lisa Adkins. We didn't really talk much about Coaching Agile Teams because that's something she's pretty much left in the past and she's moving on to more leadership work these days. And the focus of our conversation was largely around mental health and well-being. Uh, very important and relevant topic given that it was mental health awareness week at the time and the fact that uh, well everyone's mental health has been under a little bit of strain during this pandemic so interesting to get her take on that um, and check out the full episode if you want to watch the whole hour long chat which flew by uh, you can go to that uh, get that at patreon.com slash the agile podcast but other than that all we say is check out our awesome new merch which you can find at inspectandadapt.com forward slash shop and we want to give an awesome shout out to three of our brand new patrons so donna marie lee in japan john cumming in the uk and lisa crispin in the us have all joined our club so cheers to all of you and cheers, cheers to all of you here's lisa Hello. Oh, headphones in. Hello. Hello. <laughs> you weren't on mute, but you just didn't have your ears in. Oh, uh, okay. You couldn't hear me. You all right? Yeah, good. Good. Can you hear that? Oh, bottle cap's gone flying. I'm pouring a, li a glass of alcohol-free 7-Up. <laughs> alcohol-free 7-Up. <laughs> It's lovely and clear. This uh, let me let me just taste it for you. Yeah, it tastes like lemon and lime. This is tastes like the. It's a good a good port mix of this one, Jeff. I imagine. Oh dear. Some people, some of our listeners would know what we were referring to there. Oh, we must have told that story a long time ago, but in a nutshell. Well, it was probably episode three or something. Yeah, it was very early in the day, in the back in the day, wasn't it? Hmm. We were in Porto in a lovely, in the home of Port. I assume it's the home of Port. Mm. Um, and Jeff, I think it was the last evening we were at a conference there, Jeff in the hotel bar. Jeff orders me a very expensive glass of 40 year old Port. Yeah, I was treating you. It was. I took one sip of it and thought, oh no, <laughs> can't drink that. So I emptied my uh, half a can of Sprite into the. Uh, into the drink and finished it a port and lemonade, which was oh. rather nice. Well, you actually explicitly asked the barman for. Did drink. I? Yeah. Oh, I didn't have it open already. I actually yeah. asked him. Uh, that was even more embarrassing. So embarrassing. The look on his face, I imagine, was a picture. Mm. I'm surprised they let you out of the country. <sighs> I know. Well, I imagine they let you back in again. But that must have been fair in the first kind of year that we Five started years ago now. doing, yeah, doing the podcast. When it was in its infancy, mm. and now here we are, in our own homes. Yeah, I can still remember sitting out next to the river. Beautiful, wasn't and, uh, it? The Sanderman. Sandermans, yeah, lovely, wasn't it? With the boats going past. Does your Seven Up taste nicer in your glass? It does. Uh, let me, uh, let me, let me just have another sip from my uh, Agile pub cut. I'll try and hold it with a brand uh, product placement. Mm. <laughs> mm. So yes, my, my, my Agile podcast glass is, uh, is getting washed. It's, we had our lock-in last night. so We did. It was a late night, wasn't it? So now my, my merch is restricted to opening my bottle with my Agile podcast bottle opener. <laughs> and placing yes. my glass on my Agile podcast beer coaster. Yeah, my glass is also on my Agile podcast uh, coaster. So uh, I've got a nice dark amber ale from Cornwall, I think. Do Doom Bar is in Cornwall. Okay. Is it Cornwall or Dorset? I think it's pretty sure it's Cornwall. Yeah, Cornwall. The mouth of the camel estuary for you. Mm. 
My nickname. Mm. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Any good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've um, had it before when I'm, especially when I go to Cornwall. It's, it's one of the one of the classics. Yeah, have down there. But uh, the Tribune and things like that. But yeah, it's very nice, tangy Tri- tribute. Yes. Yeah, not yeah. particularly. It's not. It's a, It's just a, an ale rather than a pale ale. So not not a huge amount of hops in there. Just um, yeah, it's a little bit. I suppose you'd probably call it spicy but not particularly spicy um a very a light newcastle brown okay if you've ever had that so that diet newcastle brown i would have <laughs> but quite refreshing well, well good news jeff i'm opening the uh your birthday present to me this weekend which is a, a huge five liter keg of uh dunkerton cider which will mm. go down very nicely I think we're hoping the weather will improve, but it's um, a bit overcast forecast. But um, yeah, my family come down for a family barbecue. And it would have been, my mum reminded me today, it would have been my granddad's 100th birthday. Oh, really? Uh, if, yeah, he he died, I think he was, um, well, about six or seven years ago. But yeah, t- the Sunday would have been his 100th. So it's, even my mum was going to celebrate with a glass of cider, I think, as well. So we're oh, going to crack that open on Sunday as a special occasion. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Have you sort of birthday to your granddad yes so this is uh this is um what do we call it we're calling them summary episodes yeah it's kind of a um a uh recap a a recap an overview a review of a sort of a of a prestigious pint we had wasn't it Mm. so back well by the time this comes out maybe maybe quite a few weeks ago I'm not sure when it will come out, but yeah, a couple of few weeks ago we we got together with the one and only Lisa Atkins. Yeah, I find it strange pronouncing her name Lisa. I want to say Lisa, but Lisa, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't know many Lisas that are um, L Y double S A. That's a, yeah. apart from Lisa Atkins. But it was great to have her have her on the um, on the podcast. Mm. We had a good chat. We did. Yeah, it's um, quite a emotional one. Yeah, is that the right word. Not that we were like crying or roller coaster of emotions or anything, but it was, it was, it it touched on emotions quite a lot. Yeah, a, sa- a sensitive episode. I think. Sensitive. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. sensory. Yeah. yeah. Very good. It did. Emer- it, it it kind of evolved as these conversations do. But it did have sort of an underlying theme of um, personal resilience. Yep. Um, and how she was, she was very, um, very open with us in terms of you know, how she's been dealing with the the pandemic and how. Yeah, quite a lot of she was generalising across the whole of the country. She wouldn't she had access to um, medical friends and telling us how we weren't alone in the fact that we've we've been feeling busier but not productive. Yes. I wonder, I wonder if we've got a little a little, little sound out. bite we can play. Yeah. No, it's not just you. I really do have less capacity. And speaking of privileged places, I get to choose how much I want to work, right? Mm-hmm. So I can I can titrate how much I take in so that I have enough to give for that. And so far, you know, I'm still really functioning quite well for my clients and, um, you know, for the people I'm collaborating with. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can also feel the edge of like, how much longer can this go on? And 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 how much more capacity reduction will I experience? I feel a little bit sort of like I'm putting myself out there and maybe people won't want to contact me for work. And I'm like, <laughs> don't do that. I, I love to work. I would love to work with you. You know, I want to, and, and at the same time, I just want to take that risk because I think that, as you said, Jeff, you'd like, you know, I'm not the only one. Mm. And I, I think this is a growing elephant in the room and, 
I talked with my doctor. She's like, you would not believe how I am prescribing anti-anxiety and anti-depressants right now. Really? She said, it's unbelievable. So I want to just open up the conversation and start talking about what is going on for people. And I've been talking with my clients about, you know, so what's the capacity you're expecting hmm. from the people in your organization? You know, and how much can you scale back your ambition to meet the moment? Because the moment is not like all cylinders firing and we can just keep on this mythology of growth forever. Hmm. Yeah, a long one, a long, long clip. But um, yeah, so th yeah, it's um, it was particularly pertinent at the time, I think, that we recorded this because um, it was mental. Um, it was was it Mental Health Awareness Week? I yes. Think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, certainly in the UK. I don't know if that was a global thing or whether, but just a UK thing. But it certainly did ring true with 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 us at the time. I remember because I think I think companies have become a lot more aware and a, a lot more um, conscious of people's well being and and even within teams. You know, um, checking in with people and and you know on a human level. Um, asking, are you okay? Or, or at least acknowledging that it's okay not to be okay. Hmm. It's been rough. It has been rough for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, she used the phrase, accumulation of anxieties. Hmm. And it is lots of little things in many ways, isn't it? It's not like, I mean, for some people, they've had big disruptions. Um, but for, for many, it's lots and lots of little things that have just mm. piled on top of one another. Uh, it was a really funny, I say Freudian slip, it's, pro it's not technically a Freudian slip, but I'm not sure what else to call it, so I'll, ju I'll just play it. From a personal standpoint, I am certainly feeling what I, what I view as the accumulated effects. Mm-hmm. Of this last 12, year, 12 years. <laughs> feels like it, doesn't it? It, does it feel feels like it. like it. Oh my gosh, does it feel like it for 12 months. And that slip of the tongue. Yes. But that, that was, that's her unconscious leaking into it. And we, we joked before, haven't we, about how this, this month felt like a long week or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it does. Yeah, it time, time seems to pass a lot slower. And maybe that's a lot to do with monotony. I think in terms of, I still joke now that every day kind of looks the same. And we were talking at the lock-in uh, last night when we, in terms of, I think the thing that I miss is the variety. It's not so much the travel. It's not so much the um, the work. It's it's the variety. It's the difference in work. It's the mm. difference in locations. And I think time has seemed to pass a lot slower when there's less going on. My, my, my the diary is less busy yeah and yet it's quite amazing to think that this all started about 18 months ago yeah that's weird isn't it maybe we've become conditioned to that maybe we, you know in terms of um yeah it's but then if you think back six months ago we were i was certainly complaining about how how painful it was six months ago and you know, six months or eight months into a to the pandemic mm. and my anxiety levels were probably at their highest i think work-wise so well okay probably judging it mainly by work but um september um there was an initial kind of um kind of spirit wasn't there for well, within our house of yeah we'll get through this as a, as mm -hmm. a family but yeah, yeah by six months through that we were I think fairly worn down. Uh, six eight months in, we were yeah, we were fed up with it pretty much by then. Yeah, and um, to be fair, she wasn't just talking about just the pandemic. Although there were, there was a, a, a funny little, but it also a lot of truth in the humour. We we talked a little bit about privilege and mm. um, the sort of guilt that we feel for being frustrated with our situation when actually we have got a lot to be grateful for yeah um she used a, a really interesting phrase that she got from her daughter i'll just um i'll just play that if i've got it it was incredibly hard to buy a dishwasher 
Yeah. <laughs> it was incredibly hard to get it installed. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, like something that was just bing, bang, boom happened yeah. with no stress at all was a two month stress aroma in my house, right? So, so now let's be really clear. I, when I say that sort of thing, I immediately feel sort of like the guilt and shame of, oh my God, Lisa, you're so like dishwasher, really? Like that's <laughs> that is such a, a privileged problems. problem, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And my daughter, who's really skilled in these sorts of things would say, uh, mom, don't compare pain, mm. right? So whatever you're experiencing, that's not comparable with the pain that someone else experiences who doesn't have running water in their house. Both are pain. Yeah, both are stress, both are anxiety. And I think that, so it's, so here's the thing. It's never the dishwasher. No. It's what's, it's what's the underneath current. Mm. And that I thought was a really, I know it's a slightly jokey comment, but I think there's a lot to that because we, we do tend to think our problems are more than other people's. Yeah. But equally, we can feel guilty for focusing on our, on our own challenges. And I think one thing that I really, um, I think Elisa is amazing at is holding herself in, in a very neutral state and being able to, to take judgment out of things uh, and yeah. see things as they are um, and give people space. Yeah, and there's, I think there's a real um, there's a fine line, isn't there? Between there's, I think there's a it can be quite cathartic to um, to get things off your chest if you even if you can't buy a dishwasher or you can't you know I had to queue for the shop for the supermarket for for twenty five minutes and I've never had to do that before or I can't get hold of prunes mm. you know, in the supermarket. There's a there's a sense of um, you can download that stuff and you can vent about that stuff but you yeah it's not it should never be at the um at the expense or of, without caring about or or comparing your problems to someone else's you think that's bad look at my problems that type of thing yeah yeah i completely agree also i i, I can't think of the um the tv show now but you you will what well, nigel would be able to reel it off straight away i'm sure but there was a a, a comedy sketch from it's the monty python isn't it is it? Is it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The Monty Python sketch. Yeah, you think that's bad? I was, yes. yeah, I was living in a puddle at the end of the road. Yeah, that type of thing. Yeah. yeah. The you, you had it. You had it easy. Yeah, you yeah. had it easy. Yeah. I know you were born. <laughs> um, but that that's interesting. That's a, that's a really good point, Link. Actually, because that sense of being listened to. We've many years ago. We we encouraged teams even co-located teams who've been together for a while we encourage them to check in with one another because it's very easy to be physically present but not mentally present mm. uh, you know starting off a, a, a daily scrum for example with you know a quick check-in you know I had a really terrible commute to work today uh, I'm really worried about um, you know, my daughter's got an exam today or whatever um, and now I've got I've got that off my head out of my head off my chest and I'm here yeah. and I'm in yeah and that I think I don't know whether we've got enough of that. And my my reason for saying that, I, I raised this with, with, with Lisa when we were chatting, is that people have always said my coaching sessions, now and again they would say my coaching sessions feel a bit like therapy, but I think I've had more of that recently. Mm. And my theory is that people generally just don't get really listened to. Um, you call it listening to, you know, reloading. Um, yeah. Stephen Covey would call it listening with the intent of replying. Mm. Um, whereas in my coaching sessions, I will quite often just listen for a while and let them get that off their chest so that they're then in a state of resourcefulness. <clears throat> um, so that that's where the conversation went there. And after you know, she, she made this comment about the, so many people in the US being on anxiety medication, depression medication, and everyone sort of a breaking point if you like then my linking that with with my with my is what's the difference between coaching and therapy type pondering um i had this hypothesis that if if more people are broken or 
close to breaking point, mm. then is there actually less room for coaching now? Because one of the fundamental underpinning principles of coaching is that people are whole and they don't need fixing and they're resourceful and um, you know, they're creative and they can solve their own problems. But if more people are not whole or close to not being whole, then actually, you know, can we are we not able to coach? Do we need to add some kind of almost therapeutic skill set to our to our toolbox, perhaps? Mm. Yeah, certainly asking different questions, and and certainly, um, and it's a really difficult thing. And I don't know if, if if it is confirmation bias, but it came up for me in a class the other week. Um, in an advanced class um, for Scrum Masters that um, somebody, re again, referred to it, oh, this is this, this feels a bit like therapy, or it felt a bit, they were, they'd just come out of a coaching session, they felt a bit like therapy. Now, maybe that's because I was expecting it or anticipating it, but I think as we, and I don't think it's a bad thing, but if becoming more conscious of how people are feeling, then it's an, more important to be able to notice when you've, 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 stepped between coaching and you've gone more you've gone you've crossed that line um and whether you feel prepared to deal with it or to cope with it or to um or to advise on it whatever that might be well Lisa had an interesting take on that and you know one of the things that is a little potentially misleading is that it looks a lot like therapy yeah I mean, you're sitting down and talking, you might be using other modalities like bringing someone through a process, helping them ground in their body. So all of that would feel like therapy to someone who hasn't actually had therapy before. Mm -hmm. If someone has had therapy before and they know that the, where the focus is, is on, you know, sort of the past and how did I get here? and What do I need to unknot from the past? Then they can see the distinction. But But looking from the outside, like if you were just looking through soundproof glass at a therapy session and a coaching session mm. could you tell the difference mm. maybe not but i wouldn't necessarily assume that someone needs a therapist to function in the modern world which let's just say is more uncertain now than it ever has been and humans aren't built for uncertain yeah and that 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 comment of, do we don't need a therapist to get and that, that for me it's something that I'll, I'll caveat this this statement of people saying they they feel my coaching is like therapy because generally I'll ask so have you had therapy before this so no it's just what I imagine therapy to be like um, and it it is a common misconception and it, mm -hmm. it's we are we we um, we've talked to other people and this is sort of fresh in my mind from another conversation I've had recently about different interpretations of coaching so speaking to coaches who have a different view of coaching to me. You know, they're much more, for example, technically minded, and and I would see what they do a lot more as mentoring rather than mm. coaching. But it's such a wide school that you get these definitions a little bit muddled up. But oh, just sorry, Jeff, just to interrupt. But what? So here's a here's a hypothesis, or here's a um, a statement of debate. But is is there a perception? Do you think then, from a human point of view, and I may be putting my own spin on this, my own lens on this, but Coaching seems the the word, the um, the verb to coach, mm -hmm. tends to sound more positive in terms of it's trying to grow your strengths. And therapy on the on the flip side to that sounds like just from historical um, referencing, therapy sounds like you're fit like you say you're fixing something that's wrong about you. It's a weakness. It's a vulnerability that you have. Is it less? Is it less popular? to talk about therapy than it is to talk about coaching. Well, I still come across organisations where coaching is a is a loaded word because it's people have been coached out of the business. Um, so they've been put on a performance improvement plan and the only way that they get coaching is if they're on if, if they've been shown to be a poor performer. Oh, so you need you need to be coached if you're yeah, yes. as, as a way yeah. of performance management. And so that has a stigma associated okay. with it as well in certain circumstances. Um but yeah, it, so it, it could be the other way. But I think in general, I think you're probably right. Mm. Um, and you know, I, I, getting people turning up to coaching sessions, and they know it's a coaching session, and they know what coaching is, but they just need longer to get into a state of resourcefulness. They need to get a little bit more 
off their chest. There's a little bit more there at the start that ju they just need to wade through or, or shake off. Yeah. Um, it um, actually it's, it's a little bit might might be well. So I said, do we need? Can you see a situation where we might have you know an agile therapist in the team or something like that? And it's just, no, no, we don't. We don't need that. We don't need that to function in the in the modern world. But we might need to just be a little bit more aware of when people are in different states. Right. So I'll just play that one. Okay. Maybe not everyone needs to add this, but I think a number of us agilists need to add trauma informed to our skill set. Not like not that we're going to become experts in helping people process trauma, but we're going to become much more aware of noticing when trauma is present or it's getting recapitulated for someone and not pushing through in that moment. And that made me think of how um, so I'm, I'm really jealous of some of my kids education. Some of the lessons, genuinely, some of the lessons they've had have been brilliant. Just the non-curricular stuff, right? So, so my daughter's had lessons on self-defense. She's had lessons on small talk mm. um, and things like that. And another thing that she 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 did through school was um, she she had the chance to become a mental health first aider. And so, uh, to be able to recognise the signs within her friends of when someone might not be okay. Yeah. And it's not to turn them into a therapist or that they can you know, go and work at the Samaritans or something, but th literally the first aid is you are the first person who ca who is on site and who can give some aid until the professionals can, can take over. And having that kind of awareness and skill set at such a young age, I think is fantastic. And I think we might see a lot more of that in the workplace. Mm. You ever done anything like that? Oh, sorry, I thought you were playing something there, but that was a, a long, long pause. Um, no, I think, and that's that's the synth, something I think. I think again, it might be my imposter syndrome kicking in, but um, I think I'd I'd, suffer, I'd struggle with that. I think oh, I just it would be I don't know. I don't know what to look for. I don't know what the signals are, and I maybe I might make light of them. And my instinct, yeah, is is is. Humor always gets me out of a lot of um, sticky situations, and, and in some respects, that's the wrong option. You know, when when it's bit, I don't think I worry I wouldn't be able to spot some of these things occasionally. Um, but maybe you know, maybe I'm doing myself a disservice. I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's it's something that I think uh, I, I, I'm I'm grateful that I've picked up over the years. I just wish I'd had that those skills earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, just as things that I say to my kids, for example, you know, just just today, my youngest was just really, really upset. And my instinctive response is to say, don't be upset. Yeah. You're all right. Yeah. And that's completely invalidating his feelings right there. Now mm. I can do other things. I can distract him. I can tell him that it will be okay. Or I can, you know, ask him what he wants or what he needs. Uh, but just this, just my instinctive response to comfort him was to say no 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 don't, don't be sad don't be sad you'll be all right it's okay yeah and um, little things like that at a, at a team level of being able to to actually hear people to listen to people and it does it does take a little bit of a, a, a toll at times and people can feel really uncomfortable uh in those situations i mean i'm 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 so used to it now i'll have people crying in my coaching sessions regularly not because I've upset them, I hasten to add, mm. but just because they're just going, getting through some of the stuff that's really been bugging them, frustrating them, whether it's from other people or their own actions or what have you. Mm. Um, and it doesn't bother me in the slightest. It doesn't, it do, I don't feel uncomfortable and I, th I think they then feel comfortable with that. Uh, and then we can, we can work with it. But the, there is an element of, of an emotional toll on a coach or a friend or anybody in a supportive environment and actually Andreas asked a question one of our patrons mm -hmm. uh, Andreas asked a question he knew we were speaking to Lisa and said what do you want to ask and he wanted to know how what she recommended for looking after yourself after an emotional interaction and interestingly enough like any good agile coach she didn't answer the question 
I love my early training with the Coaches Training Institute on this, actually, because it's not the question of what do I do after, it's the question of what I do before. And so one of the things that I'm reminding myself a lot of these days is the one of the foundations, the cornerstones of coactive coaching, which is people are naturally creative, resourceful, and whole. So this is back to like, there's nothing to fix, right? Yeah. Even someone experiencing a moment of amygdala hijack because there, there's a trauma that's been recapitulated, that person is still whole. That person is still capable and, and resourceful and creative. And so my job in the, in the interaction with them is to help them explore, but to keep them at choice so that when I leave the interaction, I feel really clean that I didn't force anything on them. I didn't try to do a sell job on something I thought they mm -hmm. should do. I didn't even vote one way or the other on the thing they decided to do, mm -hmm. that it really was something they owned. So that when I leave, I'm not asking the question, oh, did I harm them? I like that phrase, keeping them at choice. Mm. I've never used that phrase, never really heard that phrase before, but it's it's a you know, a pillar of my coaching philosophy is that I don't want to choose for them. I don't want to uh, put any kind of implicit judgment on their options. Um, and so what she's saying there, which I thought was really, really powerful, is, is remind yourself before you're going in that no matter how emotional things get, mm. they're still capable of dealing with that. Um, and it's not for you to take on that emotion uh, and solve it. It's to keep them at choice. Yeah, I think you're right. I think certainly um, being more aware. So it, it made me think about empathy and about um, Daniel Goldman stuff. Was it gone? I'm sure it was. Um, around um, different levels of empathy. And I remember reading a blog of his about going from kind of superficial kind of um, empathy. I can't remember what the, the word for it was. Cognitive empathy, I think it was. Right, compassionate empathy all the way through to emotional empathy. That's literally where you, if someone starts crying, you start crying. You, you, got, you basically share that emotion. I think because especially given the current situation, given everyone's emotions are that much closer to the surface. And because you perhaps feel a little bit more distant because most of this stuff is being done rem remotely, we feel, you know, we've, um, I'm not gonna say we feel we care more, but we feel we, we need, perhaps need to become the, become the help, be the help, um, rather than trying to help people to, to get through that themselves and to and to you know, to deal with that themselves yeah well it can it can be a distraction yeah some people will use other people's situations as a distraction from their own mm. um, and that's a, a reason for for keeping people in the victim mindset and staying in the rescue mindset because then you don't have to deal with your own you don't have to deal with your own shit mm. but fair play fair play to Lisa she did actually then give uh, an example of a technique that she uses okay to help um, release any kind of emotional uh, baggage, I suppose, that's left over from from an interaction, and I I, I, I did enjoy watching your face as she was explaining this technique. I am realizing that I'm starting to carry a little bit of uh, this, is especially the larger client systems, like the larger organizations. I'm starting to carry a little bit of their stuff. Mm. Yeah, and so for that, I use something called cord release which is, this Very is something good, my good. energy um, healer taught me, which is so, oh, so good. So in a nutshell, what you're doing is you are releasing the cords or the connections mm -hmm. that you have put into the client or the clients put into you that no longer serve. Okay. You're releasing anything that does not serve your highest good. This is for your benefit. In a nutshell, which out there in front of you, and then you're just brushing your body. And you're just noticing like where it feels like there are cords, connections, bands, caps, blocks, anything that feels like it's gotten on you. 
and you're literally brushing it off and giving it back to the ground. And what I and what my uh, energy healer taught me to say is, I might easily let go of anything that is not in my highest good. Give it back to the ground. Have you tried that? No. Have you? Um, so when in in some of our classes, in the old days when we used to do classes, uh, one of the exercises that we did was visualization exercises, uh, helping people visualize alternative futures so that they mm -hmm. can uh, basically remove or reduce or mitigate the impact of a couple of cognitive biases that we have around temporal discounting and, and um, the IKEA effect. Um, and so I get them to close their eyes and I talk them through these futures and they, they tell me about it and they picture themselves in this future and, and one of them is naturally going to be less positive than another but either way in order to get back to a neutral state in between imagining those futures I will encourage them to open their eyes stand up and just shake shake their body off because naturally while you are you probably don't realize it but when you when you're when you're sleeping and when you're dreaming you're you're tensing your muscles you're mm -hmm. you're moving around sometimes you're talking your your body is, is 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 capturing different types of energy in different places different ways and by just shaking it off you kind of back to neutral again so to a degree yes um although i haven't actually consciously done that exercise at the end of a, of a coaching session generally speaking because at the end of a coaching session I do get up and I move physically somewhere else anyway. So I think I have the same kind of thing, even if it's not a, uh, a conscious, um, explicit use of that, that tool. Yeah, and I wonder if we've talked in previous podcasts a, a while as well about you can coach on the move and you can, yeah, you can do a lot of things whilst moving and that probably helps even subconsciously knowing that you're in a different place at the end on a journey, you're at a different place at the end physically than you are. Mm. We were at the beginning of that conversation. So yeah, the, just the phrase, like you say, shake, shake it off, as Taylor Swift once said. Um, very good, popular culture you. reference. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, but uh, yeah, actors do it. Yes. Um, and the, and um, uh, sports people do it. Yeah. Before um, a run, an event. I suppose it's it is a little bit about I suppose it's not just getting out of the zone but it's getting into it isn't it mm. it's putting yourself into it as well as being able to get out of it it's probably a similar uh, energy you know, you remove one set what one um, amount of energy and you focus to, to allow you to focus on another yeah you've done power posing before haven't you oh yeah 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 which is a similar stuff, kind yeah. of thing yeah yeah you know, it's manifesting through physical posture uh, a mental state and, and mm. it's a similar kind of thing um, she uses imagination perhaps a little bit more than than you are or I in that situation but it's the same kind of concept yeah your limbic brain yeah very good so, yeah uh, it was um yeah, I couldn't help but ask and I, I I do feel guilty about these types of things just like I did when we when we were speaking to Esther a few episodes ago about how uh, how people do tend to get a label and, and she is the coaching agile teams lady right so that yeah that coaching agile teams book is one that you know, almost any agilist that's been involved in agile for over a year i reckon has had that has read that book i, I, I almost be be guaranteed to say that so uh, but what was interesting is that um that she says is behind her so mm. So is that behind you now, would you say, with the coaching skills for agile people? Yeah, the, the piece, yes, it is. It okay. is. I'm not doing any training in agile coaching anymore. Yeah, and I'm, I don't have any desire or plans to create more curriculum or development mm -hmm. programs or anything like that. So here's the piece that's not done, is that the Coaching Adult Team's book is still going like gangbusters. Mm. <laughs> and so I feel there's a privilege I have of honoring that work and honoring what 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 it still wants to do in the world. And, and the piece I'm picking up from that is creating ways for more people to experience the, that content more deeply without having to go to a course. And I'm thinking about people who are in lower income situations. Mm -hmm. And so there's something brewing right now, which is um, a Coaching Agile Teams book club which will be something that we that I take a group through and record it and then it can be available for a solo journey it can be available for 
you know, um, a group of people moving together as a cohort and doing the exercises together and supporting one another. Hmm. Musical interlude there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that idea of of where she was she was going in the future, and mm -hmm. there was there was a, a lot of talk about how you know, she was thinking much much bigger picture than than agile. Um, yes. Much more global issues, planetary issues, and she's yes. picking and choosing her work now that that allow her to engage with people who have a bigger impact yeah. on on the planet. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll we won't play this now because it's actually a, a big part of it, and it's not something that we can we can summarize very very quickly. But she had this phrase: "Conscious leaders make healthy choices." that's guiding her work going forward. And I really like that phrase, conscious leaders make healthy choices. Mm. You know, if I was to put that through my own lens, you know, I talk a lot about how we don't see the world as it is, we see the world as we are. And all things being equal, people are good, people are positive, people want to be good, they want to be positive, they want to they want to grow. They, were, they, they, they like having positive, healthy relationships, and yet we don't always do the right thing. We don't always uh, make the right choice, uh, often because we have a lot of unconscious biases that are, that are going around with us, and we have assumptions and insecurities and all these sorts of things. And so what she's saying is you know, her work now is to help the people who have the potential to make an impact on the world become more conscious so they make more healthy choices and I thought it was a really interesting place that she's going there mm. yeah I mean it's, it's interesting she's yeah she's leaving that um, coaching agile um, world well, not, not, not leaving it behind I suppose but just her focus and I think a lot of people that the, the, the pandemic has brought a lot of people's um, uh, ambitions into focus a lot more and, and yeah and it's no surprise to hear Lisa's uh, going down that route but it's a, yes an inspiring place to be absolutely and if she can make if there's leaders um, that do um, benefit from her um, her uh, her work and her engaging with her then yeah I'm, I'm absolutely confident that they're, they're going to be better off because of it and you were so you, you said if and, and you did sort of ask a question you are you are you seeing a positive uptake in this? You know, are you seeing leadership teams and leaders more open to some of the concepts that we've been talking about and encouraging within the agile space? And um, she she <laughs> drew an interesting, amusing analogy. It's the last clip I'll play. I think. Um, yes, it's 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 sort of like how yoga is sort of acceptable now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, it's sort it's not it's not weird anymore. And right. not everyone yeah. wants to do it. So it's not for everybody, but it's not weird. And so she's kind of saying, well, yeah, my, my, um, the people that I'm going to work with are kind of going to self-select themselves out. She's going to be quite yeah. clear about what she's doing, why she's doing it, how she's doing it, and, and working with those that are more willing um, and interested in, in making that kind of shift yeah i think and i'm gonna make a, a a rugby analogy here mm. um but uh i think i've been told i've been by by medical professionals for a long time as a rugby player i need to do um not just rugby related drills but i need to do core fitness stuff mm -hmm. which i've always said ah well you know that's all a bit weird and i probably did use those words at one point that's you know the idea of um, stretching, Pilates, yoga. That yeah, that's that's not really a rugby a rugby player's thing, is it? But again, even in the professional, the professional areas uh, era as well now, sports people um, generally realise that it's more your whole self and and is part of the um, part of the process of being a better professional. So yeah, I think it's certainly less uh, taboo. It's less weird and. Um, yeah, I think it's an integral part of, of growth and strategy these days to, mm. to, to take on that approach. Yeah, and that, for just speaking for myself here, I, and I think you were you were kind of hinting at this, I'm, I'm jumping on your bandwagon here, I suppose. But the fact that you know, Lisa is is aiming herself at that level gives me a lot more 
hope for the future. Yeah. Because we need a lot more people like her working with the leaders of our of our uh, companies, organisations, industries. Um, so yeah, all power to it. She, she's been a she has been one of the big inspirations in the agile space um, for many years. Even though she she was saying, "Well, I haven't created I haven't created anything new for a long time," but. And, and I think she will. I th I'm sure she will continue to be. I'm not. I'm not. I don't think she's going to disappear from that. I don't know. Uh, um, at all. But I, and I think she still inspires, and she's still. Um, she is still a voice. And even on those, uh, and uh, on that call that we had with her, an hour just disappeared, didn't it? And it was, um, you know, kind of one of those um, people you, you. I'm happy to sit and listen to. Mm. Yes. So, cheers to Lisa. Yeah, cheers, Lisa. Thank you for coming on. If you want to hear the, the full episode, then that's available through our patron site, patron.com slash the Agile Pubcast, along with all of the other prestigious Pint episodes with people like Mike Cohn and Sandy Mamoli and the Pop and Deeks and Roman Pickler and all sorts of Agile legends that we've uh, that we've we've spoken to and will be speaking to going forward. Yeah, there's more to come, more there's uh, and more soon. So until then, um, if you want some merch, head on over <laughs> to inspectingadapt.com slash, slash shop and get your own Agile Podcast glasses and beer coasters and bottle openers and all sorts. But other than that, keep on doing what you're doing and we will see you again very soon. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye.